Well, good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see you all. Um, I hope uh, you guys are enjoying the, the warmer weather. I know a couple of you all have some coffee, so don't forget, on Dr. Jones, some coffee at the, at the stew, the bean. So feel free to grab some before you leave. Um, I'm thankful for Drs. Uh, Bird and Householder for speaking uh, with us today. I want to read the title so I don't mess it up. Uh, Sacred Hospitality, New Colleagues, New Stories, and New Culture. Um, I think it was Barb that reached out to uh, me or Carol initially, and we're just really thankful that um, they volunteered. We've been asking some, some people to speak on some topics that they think uh, that we have thought that they might be well equipped to, to speak on, but we we're really thankful to have volunteers. So that's kind of a call for, for, call for proposal, a proposal for papers, something along those lines, a presentation. So if any of you guys have great ideas related to collegiality, please contact me or Carol. We'd love to hear it. Um, but we're really, really thankful to have you all today. So thank you so much. I'll let you all take it away. John 6, 5 through 13. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we find bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test if he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to just have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will that go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that space, and they sat down. About 5,000 men there were. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. The disciples' eyes were on the scarcity of resources, but Jesus' eyes saw kingdom provision through the generosity, first of the boy who offered and trusted, and second of his father who gives generously. The scarcity that the disciples saw was real. They really did have not have enough food. The point is not that the disciples were wrong about how much food is scarce. The point was their focus. They focused on the scarcity, and that focus blinded them from recognizing that standing right before them was the bread of life, the one who provides generously. Often when faced with scarcity, the re re we react the same way the disciples did. We fixate on what we don't have, on the scarce resources. Sindel Melanathan, a behavioral economics professor at Harvard, and Eldar Schaffer, a psychologist at Princeton, co-wrote a book called Scarcity, in which they explore the mindsets of scarcity and abundance. They explained that scarcity is not a physical constraint, it is also a mindset. When scarcity captures our attention, it changes how we think whether it is just at the level of milliseconds, hours, days, weeks, by staying top of mind, it affects what we notice, how we weigh our choices, how we deliberate, and ultimately, what we decide and how we behave. Let's think about how scarcity affects what we notice. We call that famous gorillas video we've all seen, where you focus in on the number of ball bounces and you miss the gorilla, at least the first time you see it. Um, that's called tunneling. You miss the important context because you're fixated. We miss context. Melanathan and Schaefer explain that because things outside our tunnel get inhibited, that's why we miss the context. Whatever is outside our tunnel of focus on what is scarce, whenever anything that's outside is diminished, let's apply that idea of tunneling to the feeding of the 5,000. The disciples were tunneling. They were fixated on what was scarce. And their scarcity mindset inhibited them from being able to see the abundance that was standing before them. In fact, because of their scarcity mindset, when Jesus told them to feed the multitude, their belief 
that Jesus is the Son of God, that very belief was inhibited because they were focused on what was scarce. They kind of forgot about their belief in Jesus as the Son of God. It may be tempting for us to say, I would have trusted Jesus, um, but it's actually not really even so much about us as individuals. Melanathan and Schaefer note that this scarcity myopia is a not a personal failure. Tunneling is not a personal trait. Instead, it's a culture. It's a corporate response to a scarcity mindset. We can have a scarcity mindset individually, but it's not just individual. When scarcity is at the top of our minds, we can't be open to others, other stories, other voices, all we can consider is our version of our community and how we can keep whatever it is we see as being scarce within our control. Since the scarcity mindset is also cultural, when scarcity is a dominant cultural mindset, the community values are inhibited. For example, if we believe that friendship networks are scarce, it's hard to welcome new faculty in very well because we may end up sacrificing our current friendship network. Um, that actually happened to me. When we first came, I was explicitly told that Taylor is a tight community, and so you won't be able to find friends right away. Everybody has their friends, everybody's taken. You kind of have to wait till the next cohort comes in. If we believe that what it means to fit in at Taylor is closed, fixed, scarce, then we might end up with a shallow welcome for new faculty. You're welcome as long as you fit into what we already see and believe. The human self-defense response to scarcity is to protect what we have and try to control the scarce resources that we have access to. When we have the scarcity mindset as a culture, we have conflict after conflict because the culture is one of scarcity. This is what is really happening, though, when we have a scarcity mindset. Our enemy is lying to us. That's what's happening. He's telling us that as a community, since there is scarcity, we need to pull in. We need to tunnel. We need to protect. Our enemy is lying to us that the stories that we might tell in our mind about those who we disagree with are true. We can just keep telling stories about what their, the other's motivations might be. Those are lies that we're susceptible to if we have a scarcity culture. They exaggerate, exaggerate to the tunneling. And that tunneling that happens when we have the scarcity mindset as a culture actually inhibits what we value. That's what the researchers found. The very thing that we value gets inhibited with scarcity. And we value community. But we're actually, if we have a scarcity mindset, making community more inhibited. He, they give an example of this in their research. Uh, the busy person may be tunneling. He may value his time. He's talking about a business person that they researched. He may value his time with his children greatly, but the project that he is rushing to finish pushes all of that outside the tunnel. He may look back later in life and report a great deal of anguish over not having had time, more time with his children. It's regrettable, but this disappointment is predictable for anyone who tunnels. The scarcity mindset alters how we look at things. It makes us choose differently and it comes at a cost. It leads us to neglect the things we really value. So we inhibit our values when we slip into a cultural scarcity mindset. What might be some of the resources that as a Taylor culture, uh, we might tunnel around? Here are a few. Students. Since we are low on students, perhaps we have tunneled around our departments, our majors, sometimes turning our departments into competition with other departments. But if we are fixated on controlling the scarcity of students, we end up inhibiting culture and community. Time. Since we are all low on time, perhaps we have tunneled around our departments, our usual routines, rarely seeing faculty outside our immediate areas, and rarely taking time to have coffee. 
or at lunch and faculty in other areas. Time is a scarcity. That's an empirical reality. But that empirical reality does not require us to have a scarcity mindset in terms of how we approach time. And expanding our voices. We currently have about 43 faculty who have joined our Taylor community since 2017. Having such a large influx of new people, new voices, new stories can make us feel like our culture needs to be protected. We need to tunnel. We need to keep Taylor Taylor. We love welcoming new faculty and perhaps our welcome sometimes is somewhat conditional if we feel like the Taylor community is itself a scarcity. So, um, yeah, so, <laughs> You're good. <laughs> You're good. Thank you, Barb. Um, I want to follow up her thoughts about the conditional welcome uh, today as we talk about hospitality and collegiality and the way that we interact with each other, new faculty and current faculty as well, and the atmosphere that we create together. Uh, one note uh, before I go, you have a handout in front of you. Uh, and on the handout there will be, as we go, a few discussion questions or questions to ponder. Uh, and we're going to take a few minutes after certain sections of this talk for you to either discuss with each other or to jot down some notes that we can all talk about at the end. Uh, Barb rightly said to me that an hour of lecture at 3.30 in the afternoon is not collegial. Uh, we need to take little breaks. So you will find uh, those breaks uh, on the handout. Uh, so feel free to take notes, uh, jot ideas down. Uh, we're going to have literature class here for just a few minutes, if you're ready for that. One of the uh, many great things about studying the humanities uh, is that every question uh, that we wrestle with, every idea that we ponder has been written about, has been wrestled with and pondered in the past. Uh, we can find examples uh, in the literature somewhere, uh, and it's always gratifying when I can show my students, in world literature in particular, that some of the urgent human concerns that we face right now were urgent a long time ago also. Um, I've brought with me uh, some thoughts about the Odyssey, uh, which was written, uh, scholars actually, well, let's be honest, they're not exactly sure if Homer was even a single individual, but if he was, uh, they're not exactly sure where he was writing or when he was writing, but the closest they can get is uh, an estimation that he was approximately contemporary with King David uh, in Israel. And I, because I'm me, uh, I like to imagine a random, it's always a Tuesday in my head, when David, who's not quite the king yet, wakes up and looks across the valley and sees Goliath and he's gonna go fight Goliath. And roughly a thousand miles away at the very same time, Homer is sitting in his little hovel on an island off of Greece, writing the story of Odysseus. Uh, could have happened on the same day. I can't prove that it did. Uh, you can't prove that it didn't. Uh, so that's what we're doing. Um, so Homer was writing at this same time, roughly seven to 800 years before Jesus. And uh, I wanna give you a brief uh, glimpse at two scenes in which hospitality was practiced perfectly. Uh, Barb just ended with the thought of conditional welcome, and I would like to show you the opposite uh, as it occurs in the Odyssey. The first four books of the Odyssey, we don't actually meet Odysseus. The first four books are focused on his son, Telemachus. And you have a character list on your uh, handout, so I'm gonna try to say the Greek names. Telemachus is his son. He's roughly 20 years old. Odysseus has been gone for 20 years. He was 10 years fighting in the Trojan War, and then as we learn later in the Odyssey, it took him 10 years to get home. He left when Telemachus was a baby. Telemachus is in Ithaca, and he is under siege by 110 suitors who have come to claim his mother Penelope as their bride. And their, their sort of running thesis is, Odysseus isn't coming back. It's time for her to marry someone. And she remains faithful to her husband, but Telemachus is in a bind. And so he decides to go out on a journey to seek information about his father because he needs to know if he's really dead, I need to know this. If he's coming back, I want to hasten this. And so he leaves. And he is accompanied on this uh, journey by an old warrior who is his guide. Now the reader knows that this old warrior is Athena, the goddess, in disguise. But she is disguised as an old warrior named Mentor. And just for a fun fact, that is where we get the term. 
So if you've ever talked about mentorship, or if you've ever been a mentor for somebody else, you have been quoting the Odyssey, even if you didn't know that. So mentor guides him and says, we should go visit King Nestor, the, the king of Pylos, who is a great friend of your father's. He might have some information, and so they go. Now, this is one of the two scenes I want to show you. They arrive at the house of King Nestor, and the text says immediately, there's a big feast going on. Every time anybody lands anywhere in the Odyssey, there's a feast going on. That's just what they did. They didn't have refrigerators, and they didn't have TV. So they ate when they got food, and then they just talked until they ate again. That's what they did. So they show up, and there's a feast going on, and the text says everybody sprinted. They ran down to the coast and welcomed the visitors. And the fastest runner was Nestor's son, whose name is Pisistratus, and he's carrying a goblet somehow as he's sprinting of welcoming wine. And he comes and says, this is for you, dear guests, and I'm, I'm going to give it to Mentor first because he's older, even though the younger one appears to be the captain of the ship. And in this way, he signals that he understands hospitality. And then Nestor finally reaches, because he's a slower runner, and he says, come back to the house. You're welcome here. My house is yours. And they go inside, and he says, first things first, we're going to eat. He doesn't ask them who they are, doesn't ask them their names. He says, we're going to eat. And so they sit down, he washes their hands, and they eat. And then there's a refrain, a line that appears over and over in the Odyssey. It says, once they had put aside desire for food and drink, then he says, let's ask them who they are. And he does it in a very special way, and it's the reason I bring this scene to you. He says to them, tell us your story. Who are you? Are you travelers? Are you explorers? Are you traders? Or... Are you pirates? Are you out robbing people? Are you pillaging lands? Either way, you're welcome in my house. I have brought you in. You are safe here. Tell us your story, whatever it may be. All the food that's here, all the house, it belongs to you. He does not check them at the door. He does not ask them, are you worthy of hospitality? He brings them in and then asks. Uh, Telemachus at that moment says, okay, here's my story. And this is the expectation. It's actually an exchange. Nestor has said, I will give you everything of value that I have, which is my home, my reputation, my hospitality. I need from you the thing that you have that's valuable, which is your name and which is your story. And when you give me your story, your story adds to the story of my house. Because from here on, I can say, I hosted whoever it is that you're about to tell me you are. And this is hospitality. So Telemachus says, here is why I'm here. Here's who I am. I'm looking for information. And Nestor first says, I love the way you speak. You sound like your father. He, his articulation, he said, I wouldn't have thought a young person like you could speak like that. And then he says, I'm sorry, I don't have the information that you need. But our friend King Menelaus might. And so I, want, I would like you to depart. I want you to go visit Menelaus, and as a gift, because you have honored my house with your presence, I will send a gift with you, which is my son. And so Pisistratus and Telemachus leave by chariot to visit Menelaus. Mentor does not accompany them because Mentor has done his job already. He has set the young one on the path. He goes home. They go to Menelaus, and when they arrive, there is a horrible breach of hospitality for just a second. So they arrive at the palace, and guess what's going on? There's a feast. That's what they do. This one's a planned feast, and they know how many people are going to be there, and they know how much food they need. And so Menelaus has an aide at arms, his chief advisor named Etionius, who sees the young men at the gate. And now he's got a choice. I can run to the gate, or I can retreat. And he retreats, and he goes to King Menelaus, and he says, King, there are two strangers at the gate. Should I suggest that they go to the next house where they can be better hosted? And Menelaus, it said, the text says, the king was in great displeasure. And he looks at him, and I'm paraphrasing, and he says, we've known each other for a long time, and you've never been an idiot before. And now you stand before me saying this garbage. Sprint to the gate and open the gate, and then you yourself unhitch their horses. This is beneath his station but he's made an error. And so they welcome the young men in, and immediately when they come in, they are given a bath in bronze tubs by women slaves. They are rubbed down luxuriously with new oil. They are given new clothes. 
And then they are brought into the feast, and Menelaus says, come up here to the top of the room, and you'll sit right next to me in the seat of honor. And he says, this meat on my plate, the choicest cut, was given to me as king. I will feed it to you from my hands, and you will have all the food you need. And after you're done, I want to hear who you are. But in the meantime, let me tell you who I am. And he tells the story, a very long story in the text, my students think, of the story of his house and the sorrows and the joys. He was the husband of Helen of Troy, who was taken to Troy, which is why the Trojan War happened. And he said, she was taken and I led the army and we had all these adventures. And he keeps talking about Odysseus. And as he talks, Telemachus, who's trying to eat, is weeping. And he becomes vulnerable. Menelaus becomes vulnerable. And this is part of the modeling. I want to share my story vulnerably so that you can also. But there's an awkward moment. It's time for Telemachus to talk, but he's crying. And just at that moment, Helen of Troy walks in, the most beautiful woman in the history of the world, they thought at the time. Who knows? And she walks in, and she sees what's happening, and she sees he's crying. And to save him the embarrassment, she says, you know that young boy right there? He looks a lot like Odysseus. I wonder if that's his son. And so she introduces him for him because his voice was taken by emotion in that moment. And then he's free to tell his story. At the end of the story, they send him away also with gifts and information. And Menelaus says, again, you have honored our house just by being here. Now, the Greeks saw this act of hospitality as sacred. They saw and believed, and you can see it actually in the scene with Nestor, that occasionally when a stranger comes to your house, it might be a god in disguise. We have a verse in our Bible in Hebrews. It's 13.2. I looked it up. That occasionally when you offer hospitality to a stranger, you might be entertaining angels unaware. The Greeks got there before the New Testament did. They believed this. They saw the image of the gods in the strangers they welcomed, and this was a sacred act. I hear these words in Jesus when he talks about the least of these. I hear these words uh, in Jesus, when he sent the disciples out two by two, if you remember, he said, go to the first house in the village. If they welcome you in, stay there the whole time. If they don't welcome you in, leave that village. He's talking about these sacred acts. Again, it baffles my students sometimes in World Lit when we see Christian ideas in a pre-Christian text. One of the questions that I have on your handout for you to ponder is what do we do with that? What conclusions? How do you handle that in your disciplines when we see God's truth in a text that isn't a Christian text? So that's one thing to consider. Um, I would also like to give you a break from listening to us for just a minute. If you look at this, the question to discuss, what facets of this visit do you think, uh, to Nestor or Menelaus, might be relevant as we consider hospitality here at Taylor. Clearly, we're not going to sprint out to the gates with wine. That isn't what we do. I'm not against it, but that's not what we do. But what do we do? How do we translate this into what we do here at Taylor that might be hospitable? So take a couple minutes, if you would, and jot some notes down. Kingdom reality turns scarcity upside down and declares that instead we need an abundance mindset. Luke 6:38, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap, for with the me measure you use, it will be measured to you. Walter Brueggemann helps us to see abundance and scarcity through a lens of faith. He says this, this is a longer quote. The conflict between the narratives of abundance and scarcity is the defining problem confronting us at the turn of the millennium. The gospel story of abundance asserts that we have originated in the magnific magnificent, inexplicable love of a God who loved the world into generous being. What we know about our beginnings and our endings then creates a different kind of pre present tense for us. We can live according to an ethic whereby we are not driven, controlled, anxious, frantic, or greedy, precisely because we are sufficiently at home and at peace to care for others as we have been cared for. 
The feeding of the multitudes is an example of the new world coming into being through God. When the disciples, charged with feeding the hungry crowd, found a child with five loaves and two fish, Jesus took, blessed, broke, and gave the bread. These are the four descriptive, decisive verbs of our sacramental existence. Jesus conducted a Eucharist, a gratitude. He demonstrated that the world is filled with abundance and freighted with generosity. If the bread is broken and shared, there is enough for us all. Jesus is engaged in the sacramental subversive reordering of public reality. I loved that line from Brueggemann, uh, and that's something I put on your quote, uh, on your sheet, that for us to think about. I think, oh, since we just had a little break, we're going to keep going, but we might return to that quote, and you might just continue pondering that, um, that line from Brueggemann. I love the freighted with generosity. That's one of those lines. I wish I had written that. That's really, really, that's so good. So part of what, what we wanted to do here today was to bring our own disciplinary knowledge, but we're also bringing in our, our personal stories. At least I'm going to share uh, mine of, of coming to Taylor. Um, and I, I, uh, I've been here 15 years now. This is my 15th year, which is hard to believe. Uh, I remember in the days leading up to my interview at Taylor that I had a, I had a conversation with my parents. They knew I was applying for this job, and uh, they were worried that I might not fit in here. They wondered if I would. Uh, they tactfully noted my appearance, my shaved head, my earring, my research in and deep affinity for Gothic literature. Uh, they noted a little extra tactfully my resistance to being told how to think about things, my stubbornness, uh, a facet of my personality that they might have encountered before, occasionally in my 33 years of life at that point. Uh, they didn't know a whole lot about Taylor's culture, and I didn't either. And they were afraid that their boy wouldn't fit in here. And I told them at the time that I felt a deep sense about applying here, a deep sense of peace about applying here and interviewing here if I got that far and that if God was leading me here, I would feel the welcome I needed. It was idealistic and hopeful, and I, but I felt it. I felt it deeply. I said specifically to them that if I arrived on campus for my interview and it was clear that I wouldn't be welcomed here, it would be okay, because I didn't want to be there anyway. On the evening before my interview, I had a brief phone call from Tom Jones, who was the dean at the time. Uh, and he shared with me that I was the twelfth person to be considered for that position in the English department. This was July to start in August. He also shared that I would be the final candidate to be considered for that position. And I had a brief moment of trepidation there as I considered the possibility that I was competing against no one for this job and that after meeting me they, they might pick no one instead of me. And that hurt my feelings just a touch because I'd hate to lose to an empty seat. And yet, the peace that I had quickly returned. I had nothing to lose by showing up and by being myself. And that was actually a gift. It wasn't me against somebody else. It was just, come here, let's see who you are. Take it or leave it is basically how I came here. During my interview the next morning, I certainly did feel welcomed by everyone I met by Tom Jones, certainly, by the English department, by the interview committee. Tom, in particular, encouraged me to be genuine and honest. I asked him questions about my appearance. I didn't own a sport coat at the time. Is that OK? About my expectations of how I should dress, about the type of writing I do, the type of researching I do. There's nothing to hide here. This is what I am. The, the dark and the scary stories appeal to me. Is that OK? And he told me this in so many words, that if it appears to everyone in the interview process that I'm being called here, then I will be welcomed. And I will be expected to bring the gifts and talents and interests and abilities that God had developed in me to that point. And further, that I would be given room and expectation to continue to develop those interests and gifts and abilities in the service of our students. The sense I gathered was that if I was invited in, I would be invited in fully as myself, as the product of the journey I had taken to get here, 
When I walk into the classroom, I would embody that which God had given me. Of course, I did get the job. And although the job initially was a one-year position, I'm still here. It was renewed once and then again, and then someone retired, and there was a tenure-track position, and this is my 15th year. And throughout that time, Tom Jones and Nancy Dayton and so many of the people in my Taylor circles have remained supportive and welcoming as I have grown from the 33-year-old with a shaved head and an earring and a stubborn independent streak a mile wide, mile wide and a new interest in Gothic literature into this person, 48 years old, with buzzed hair and two earrings, and a deep and reasonably well-published interest in Gothic literature, and a stubborn independent streak two and a half miles wide. I have flourished here, to quote Jeff Kramer, and I have done so because I was welcomed in, and I was allowed to grow. There's a question on your handout. Think about your interview. Think about your experience here in your first year. Not everybody's was like mine. And I think partly that's why we're here to talk today. I received the hospitality that was invitational to me to be who I am. And I was given space to grow and I was given support to grow. Think about your interview. Think about what experiences you had, about how your story, your voice might contribute to Taylor. Because it was made clear to me early on that my voice would matter. Now, you can jot. I'm going to keep talking, keep taking notes. One of our principal concerns as we put these ideas together today is that here at Taylor, we might be on a troubling trajectory in these matters. After all, we need to have these collegiality seminars. We believe that a scarcity mindset, scarcity in resources, or in cultural power or relevance, essentially the whole wide variety of fears we might feel, feel at Taylor right now, those diminish our ability to practice hospitality to our new faculty and indeed to each other as we continue to live here together. We run the risk of welcoming new faculty not as whole people with vibrant voices and fresh ideas, but instead as pegs to be fit into pre-drilled openings. We might restrain them. We might inadvertently convey to them that they are here for us, rather than, well, rather than that we welcome them to share and add to what is here. Consider King Nestor, who welcomed Telemachus, though he did not know who he was. Nestor trusted in his gods to honor his righteous hospitality, even if his guest was unworthy of that welcome. Or consider Menelaus, who chastised his servant for reasonably inquiring about whether or not there was enough at the feast to add two more people. He chastised him for that. Of course there's enough. Both of these gracious hosts made their spaces available and welcomed the travelers and the full, honest stories they brought with them. And Telemachus was able to thrive in bo both places. It was a coming of age for him, and he grew in confidence and in stature and esteem, even as he blessed both houses with his story and left them richer in his wake. As we seek to be hospitable and to shape a culture of collegiality here, we must rise above the inclination to see Taylor fit in a scarce way. We don't want to narrow our entrance gates so that all who come here receive a highly conditional welcome. We don't want to turn what could be wide open fields of exploration and growth and wonder into narrow, inhospitable corridors in which movement and disagreement and growth are largely precluded. Can we honestly say to new faculty, come as you are? Can we say to those we offer employment, as was said to me, there's no one here quite like you. And we're excited to see how you shape what we do. Are we faithful enough as we consider new candidates to concede that their journeys here might not look like ours? That perhaps God has taken them through things that have led them to ideas and abilities and interests we've never seen before? And are we bold enough to know 
that those differing journeys might actually broaden and deepen the love and connection we offer each other and our students. There's a pondering question again, and I'll leave you with that. Think about three colleagues, and I bet you can think of more, who have different life stories from you, come from different places, study different things. Think about how those differences have enriched our collective story. As you ponder those differences, it's easy to think in terms of somebody has a different skill set or a different personality. Um, but also, we encourage you to think about those who have um, oddities or quirks or um, social awkwardness things that you think, okay, that's a bit different. Uh, academic faculty tend to be a little bit um, odd. And these are build up a richness for our community and uh, so sometimes those are the very things the the God uses weaknesses as much as strengths and those oddities make up a beautiful community that tell different stories depending on who's here of this house that we call the Taylor community so we all have the choice of living into cultural scarcity mindset or abundance. So what are some of the reasons to move into more of an abundance mindset at, culture, at Taylor? So first, only with an abundance mindset can we actually live out the LTC. That's, that is, live out the gospel to each other. A scarcity mindset, a culture of that, leads to narrowing of assumptions about others that the enemy loves to spur in us, especially those with different views than ours. An abundance mindset, on the other hand, that allows us to see the best in others, to assume the best motivations about others. And it opens us to be curious about those that have very different views than we do. That curiosity creates connection. Second, only with an abundant mindset can we thrive. This is actually an uh, outcome of an abundant mindset. It is because we are generous that we gain. That's the upside down, we're the upside down, heaven is the right side up, um, gospel truth that those who give, then more is given back. I want to tell you um, a somewhat recent real life example of this truth because it's actually not only a social truth, it's a chemical uh, kind of reality. So um, I'm a runner, but actually more accurately a plotter. Uh, so in the running world, I began, I like watching the um, Boston Marathon, and in 2018, I was immediately drawn to one of the elites, Desiree Linden, because over and over she was described as a plotter. I thought, ha, that's somebody I can relate to. And although she plods way faster. <laughs> so I was thrilled when she won. She actually won. And it was the one, I think this is one of the coldest Boston marathons ever. She was the first woman, American woman, to win Boston in over 30 years. So there's a lot written about her. And what I found really fascinating, in Runner's World, uh, they had a, a chemical specialist uh, talk about how she won, why she won. So he says in the, in the Runner's World art article, your brain releases endorphins, dopamine, and serotonin when you help someone. Endorphins have a morphine-like way of reducing pain. Dopamine increases motivation and focus, and serotonin boosts your mood, says Detlane, who did the research. I have no doubt that this surge of most hormones helped Lyndon. Because you see what happened, it was really cold and she felt pretty early on she was not even gonna be able to finish the race. So she went up to another front runner, American, and said, I'll do whatever you need. I'll slow down, I'll do, be the wind guard, whatever you need, I will do so that you, to help you win. And it is that act, as well as another act that the, um, that Detlin said of, of being in a pack, being in a community together that she sacrificed for, that's how she won. And that's, those are built in. Think about any time that you've uh, been tired but you still decide I'm gonna 
give this, bring this uh, meal over for a colleague who's hurting, or you've decided you're going to serve on Thanksgiving Day, or whatever service you're doing, whenever you do that, don't we always come away thinking, wow, I feel more blessed than what I gave. We always do, because that's how God built that into us. So that's the second reason why a generosity, abundant mindset is needed in our Taylor community. We have to have that to thrive. And a much social science research has shown that a diversity of perspectives brings the best ideas and innovation. And that is what Taylor needs now. But we can't get there if we have a scarcity mindset. So adopting an abundance mindset as a defining feature of our Taylor culture actually allows us to step out in faith and see and watch God providing abundantly more than we can ask or think or imagine. As we end this time, the last question that we really do want to spur a conversation with you about is what would sacred hospitality a generosity, abundant mindset look like in our community now? What are some actual ramifications of that? What would that look like with feet on the ground? What are some specifics that we could say, this is what we need to be aiming for, this particular practice? So since this is recorded and it probably can't hear, I want to see if I can capture some of these just for those who are recording, who, who are listening. So feeling like we belong, saying our name, hearing a hallway conversation that is encouraging when you need it, um, uh, being encouraged when you're first coming that we want you to stay. Um, and please plan on staying here forever. Uh, did I miss anything? Uh, being careful that sometimes in scarcity it is tempting because we're academics and because there real are scarcities to um, hunker down and compete, um, but we don't have to do that. Because we're all in this together. Yeah, we're in this together. Well, thank you all very much for coming, and thank you for whoever's watching. We appreciate you too. You belong too.